By this point, it's no secret that I love animation, and I hate big corporations, which means that I really like indie animation. Glitch Production's newest IP, The Amazing Digital Circus, is now officially the most watched animated indie pilot, and I think it's very well deserved. The voice acting is great, the character designs are all super fun, and of course, the music is banger. The score flawlessly combines wacky jazz ideas, dark orchestral underscore, and catchy circus tunes into a vibe that's simultaneously fun, but also unsettling. I tried transcribing some of the music, but after looking at it, I realized I have no idea what I'm talking about, so I reached out to one of the composers for help. And he agreed. In the pilot of The Amazing Digital Circus, we see main character Pomni get isekai'd into the eponymous digital world, meet the cast of wacky characters, avoid the entire Gloink storyline, and obsess over finding an exit. Tonally, this episode is pretty interesting. Near the beginning, everything is bright and cheerful, reminiscent of the tone of a children's cartoon, albeit with light foreshadowing to the true nature of the digital circus. The opening theme glitches and repeats for a small section, objects clip into the geometry, and a startled Pomni is told she's trapped in the circus forever. Despite this, the ringleader, Kane, tries his best to distract and keep the tone wacky and relatively cheerful. The music seems to match this kind of quirky, meta-ironic vibe. The main theme features mostly MIDI instruments, a jumping tuba bassline, circusy organs and bell arpeggios, and a mostly friendly, diatonic melody. We'll talk about this theme in a bit. But first, I want to dive into the underscore, the non-diegetic tracks that play during the rest of the episode. opinion, these tracks are even wackier than the intro theme, with funny little instruments and harmonies that meander out of the discernible tonality, resulting in music that ultimately feels a tad off-kilter despite being cheerful. What were your thoughts when writing this, Evan? So there's really two kinds of music in the pilot. There's the circus music that like plays by the rules set in the virtual game world, and then there's the more orchestral focused underscore that sets like a mysterious or sinister tone when that's needed. Everything for the circus sections is just sort of this like stream of consciousness of various jazz ideas. There's just a lot of, I don't know, like different genre mashing going on. Uh, we picked up a lot of inspiration from Bo N. I think it's like pretty obvious, uh, especially this stuff on snipper clips. The idea was to get these like exuberant and silly sounding tracks that also work as these like tonally complex earworms, which I think uh, Bo N or like Koji Kondo have really mastered. I think one of the uh, most charming bits about music in Nintendo games is really how much musical knowledge is displayed by the composer when on the surface you have this music that sounds like goofy and immature. That's actually so cool. I remember when watching this the first time, I was getting a kind of Bowen vibe I couldn't quite place. Definitely a great inspiration. And as you said, the score feels like it's split into two halves. Shortly after Kane gives the circus inhabitants the Gloink's mission and leaves, Pomni, Jax, and Ragatha encounter the first truly unsettling thing in the episode, an abstracted, monstrous Kofmo. At this point, the score completely changes. Contrasting the brighter and wacky Calypso-like tracks from earlier, this cue is dark and entirely orchestral. The orchestral stuff is definitely the stuff that I enjoyed the most. Uh, that's purely because I'm a huge fan of writing orchestral music in general. Uh, the Kofmo track heard in the pilot is actually its second iteration, uh, and it was a joint effort between Goose and I. You can hear the first version in the full soundtrack release. The swap was just to get more of like a uh, melodramatic tone versus this like purely evil or sinister sound. One of my favorite parts in the orchestration and composition was just how much planing it uses. Just for anyone that doesn't know what planing is, uh, it's when you take all the voices in a chord and you move them purely in parallel motion uh, with the intervals between those voices not changing at all. So you hear this a lot in like John Williams music, for example. Uh, there's a section with the brass when Ragatha is getting tossed around where the horns and trumpets are just like moving chromatically through the scales.
Uh, and then the music quiets down and we get kind of a similar vibe on the piano and the woodwinds with like this descending line uh, planning a, I don't know, like a minor chord with the major seven. Uh, my absolute favorite addition that I know will sound very lame is this subtle detail that I'm sure almost no one cares about. And that's during the big dramatic chords in the middle of the track. You can hear a wood block playing in the percussion session. It's just something that it's one of those additions of percussion colors and orchestral music. It adds so much like just good flavor to a cue. The woodblock itself is straight up inspired by the fourth movement of Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony. If you want some really good woodblock, uh, you have to listen to that one. So cool. And the score stays entirely in this kind of orchestral vibe, growing more unsettling while Palmny begins her slow descent into insanity. The tension in the score continues to build while Palmny is lost in the, the back rooms, rooms, and the music reaches a climax while she opens a door that traps her in the void. The music here is crazy, with vast sweeping lines that overlap with each other and punchy trumpets that trail off into the abyss. But also, Evan did something really, really cool here that I'd love for him to talk about. So this was a pretty interesting technique we tried. Uh, basically, the cue is written forwards and then reversed, and then rewritten in MIDI as its reversed form. And then you export that, and then this new version uh, gets reversed. So you get like the original Q, but with like the reverse -y sound. Uh, it's basically like the Twin Peaks dream dialogue technique, if you've ever seen that show. Doing this whole thing, we actually found that the ethereal nature of the cue didn't super lend well to the reverse sound because it kind of just becomes a wash. So in post, I ended up layering in the reversed cue that was made over just the original version. And then I would just bring it in at the end of each measure to emphasize that like pulsing sound you get when you reverse a sound. It's such a cool technique. It adds that subtle but recognizably reversed quality to the music while keeping all the elements intact and moving forwards. So cool. The cue itself was probably my favorite to write. I definitely put the most time into it. Going into it, I knew I wanted to have a buildup and then like a big release during the shot that's just the gaze into the void. 
Uh, I just had to find a good way to get there. I actually got started on the whole thing after listening to another piece by Prokofiev, uh, which has this sort of similar like ascending sound. And I thought, I just thought it was perfect, right? So it ended up working as like this jumping off point for the inspiration. I am not going to say which one though, because I want all of the listeners out there to do some homework. I also knew that in the sequence, I wanted to have this ascending melody line that sort of like struggles to hit all of the chord tones. So I have it do this thing where it weaves in and out of the tones in just a C major scale. You get this sort of sense of uh, direction that it's moving up, even if it's like kind of wobbly. Uh, then for the final chord, there'd be this like voice leading movement that kind of throws you off and then finally just lands you on this huge fortissimo final chord. At the end of it all, we really just go from C to F, uh, but it feels like we went on quite a journey to get there. I've seen people point out in the orchestration that there's these like echoing trumpets that pay homage to the score from the Matrix. Um, but being totally honest, I didn't even know that the Matrix sounded like that or had that quality in it. Uh, so the similarities are purely coincidental. Uh, I think like thematically, it obviously fits basically perfectly. Uh, and I'm kind of glad that it seems to have accidentally invoked that, you know, the reference. Um, the real inspiration for those trumpets is all Colin Stetson's Reborn, uh, which is it's a piece of music that I have a very deep admiration for. To me, the trumpets convey this sense of like grandiosity and scale, uh, like that particular instrument's attachment to like the regal uh, really helps give it that sense. And the rapid playing gives it this like chaotic echo that would exist in a place like the void. It's just like endless chaotic expanse. After Kane rescues Pomni from the void and returns to the tent, the music once again shifts in tone back to how it was before he left. The circus inhabitants are rewarded with a feast, where a frazzled Pomni finally comes to the realization that this isn't a dream and she truly is trapped here for eternity, during which we're greeted by a reprise of the main theme. We never actually listened to it earlier, so let's listen to a small snippet. As mentioned earlier, it's cheerful and ironic, but there are small things that come together to make the listener uncomfortable. Let's look at the instruments. The aggressively synthetic MIDI trumpet and the detuned toy piano feel uncanny. The melody is mostly diatonic and stays in the key, except for these little chromatic sections where it dips out momentarily. But also near the end, we change keys from E flat major to the brighter E major, going into one final repeat of the theme before ending on a quirky little fanfare. To me, this needlessly bright key change seems to mirror the forced cheerfulness that Kane exudes to distract from the horrors of the digital circus. While the wacky cheerfulness of this new key is brash and in your face, you can still slightly hear those pained screams with the choir underneath. And I think that's a really neat touch. But one thing I personally find the most interesting about this theme is the chord progression. This is a simplified version of the anime canon chord progression, which I talked about in my anime canon video. In case you haven't seen it, to summarize, this chord progression is the classic Packable Canon chord progression. Except with a more modern, jazzier harmony. This is my favorite chord progression of all time for so many reasons, but I especially love how stable yet dynamic it is. Until we change keys to E major, we never feel like we're leaving E flat, despite the chords moving all over the place. It's a familiar and very recognizable chord progression, which makes for an excellent theme. This familiarity is taken advantage of, you are lulled into a false sense of security by this jovial chord progression, and almost don't consciously notice the most unsettling elements of the theme. 
The reprise, which we'll talk about in a second, matches the anime canon progression even closer, and this is just all my analysis, but I was able to ask the composer of the theme, Gooseworks, what inspired her to use the chord progression for the theme, and she had this to say. The main theme and Your New Home both have different chord progressions. The main theme was just me using all the chord changes I like, and Your New Home just took that and put it over a slight variation on the canon and D chord progression. I think that's also the same chord progression in Com Su Ser Todd, or very close to it. So there we go, it looks like Gooseworks is another canon believer. What are your thoughts, Evan? What can I say? It's catchy. So that's more or less everything to do with the main theme, and jumping back to the end of the episode, we have the aforementioned reprise. Let's play a snippet of it. It's still recognizably the theme, but all of the unsettling elements are made more prominent. The melody starts on an unrealistic, plinky MIDI piano before being performed entirely by MIDI strings, whose synthetic quality once again feels uncanny. The stilted, unnatural choir is much louder. The minimal tuba bass line is replaced with powerful string basses doubled with timpani hits. This part plays while the camera zooms in on Pomni, who slowly realizes the reality of her situation. Then, the music pivots to a more fanfare-like ending. Let's take a listen. this plays, the camera zooms out on the digital circus, showing how small their entire world is and highlighting the uncomfortable claustrophobia of the setting. As the ending theme reaches its peak, we have a circus-like fanfare with a sequence of weird, chromatically moving chords. These chords are wild and deceptive. That first chord of the fanfare, E major, in the context of our key of A flat, sounds like the flat 6. In the context of a major key, and especially an ending fanfare, we usually expect this chord to go up a whole step to the flat 7, before resolving up one more whole step and landing back on the 1. You've probably heard the sequence dozens of times. Famously, it is the flagpole fanfare from Mario. It's familiar and the most expected resolution, but Gooseworks subverts this and the chords step chromatically into the more unstable G7, and then B flat 7, and then this B diminished ish chord, and then a beat of silence, and finally that resolution of A flat major we've been waiting for. This is so cool for so many reasons. The chords obviously feel super weird, and something neat is happening with the individual lines that make up the chords. We have what is called contrary motion. Some instruments move in opposite directions of others. Listen to the bass for instance, I've isolated it. It exclusively moves up during this line, but listen to what happens in the strings for instance. The strings move down. With the higher voices falling and the lower voices rising, the chords are literally closing in on themselves, mirroring the visuals during this final scene. And the chords themselves are wild. That G7 is up a minor third from the E7, and the B flat 7 is up another minor third from the G7. This is the beginning of a pattern. Let's visualize it using the circle of fifths. As you can see, we go counterclockwise 90 degrees from E to G, and another 90 to B flat. Logically, it would make sense to continue the pattern another 90 degrees to a D flat 7, but our expectations are once again subverted. We go to this super tension y and unexpected B diminished ish chord. We hang in silence after hearing this insanely jarring and suspenseful chord, before finally resolving to the tonic A flat major for a climactic finish. How would you analyze that penultimate chord, Evan? So, knowing Goose and knowing that she technically doesn't have any like formal training in music theory, uh, I'm not sure if I can really like analyze this chord. I think it's more just like the intentionality is there of a crazy dissonant chord before the big final major chord. It's 
probably some form of diminished chord though, just judging by its general quality. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think the cool thing about music theory is that function is derived entirely from sound. Even if this chord wasn't written using the so-called conventions of diminished chords and their constructions, it literally doesn't need to be. It's tensiony and it fits, and I think that's all that matters. But anyways, with that, the credits roll and the episode is over. Once again, thank you so much, Evan, for joining us. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for having me. I can always talk about the wacky music that I write. And with that, I hope everyone is looking forward to even more wacky music, because it's definitely coming. If you haven't already, watch the show. It's cool. Also, make sure you guys each buy 17 Pomni and Jax plushies so they have the budget to make the rest of the season lickety split year. Also, Glitch, if you guys are watching this, please, I am begging you, make a plushie for Kinger. I've resorted to making my own bootleg in the meantime. Ah!